All right. I wanted to say a little bit about good old St. George, though, because he's a fascinating guy when you get into it. So, like I said, he's he's a credentialed scientist in the 19th century. Uh, he's he's a smart guy. He did some really good work on primatology. Yeah, so he's he's figuring all this stuff out. He's got no problem with species changing over time, uh, but he he's got some other problems. It it seems like he was a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a troll and a troublemaker. So he had a very severe, serious fallout with uh, Charles Darwin. Yeah, in the late 19th century, didn't you didn't want to get on Charles Darwin's bad side. And I'll show you just how bad it got. Uh, so here's good old St. George Jackson Mevert. Very British. Yeah, and there he is posing for us all. And uh, he got into all these battles with various people of the time. I, you know, it's it's too bad he didn't live here in the 21st century because he would take to Twitter easily. Yeah, he'd be on YouTube challenging everybody to a debate. That's that's the kind of guy he was. And he was he was kind of constantly put down by this. Now, in some ways, I kind of feel sympathy for him because uh, one of his other characteristics is that Mevert was a Catholic. And I did not realize this, but it, in the time of Darwin and Mevert, Catholics were not allowed to attend Oxford University. He was thoroughly qualified to go to the most prestigious university in the land, uh, but he was flatly refused because he was Catholic. What a weird thing. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I have no sympathy for Catholics in general. I, I think it's a silly religion, but then so is Anglicanism. Uh, but I do have a lot of sympathy for people who are discriminated against. And he was clearly discriminated against, which is just really a shame. Okay, but he got into all these battles with people and he's gonna end up alienating everyone. So here, for instance, uh, he had a big, you know, literary fight with Charles Darwin. And what brought it on? Well, uh, this was in the 1870s. Charles Darwin's son, George, wrote a letter to one of the newspapers that was basically arguing, hey, you know, divorce can be a good thing. You know, if, if you've got if you've got a an abusive husband, yeah, the, the better thing to do is to divorce him, and so he's advocating for you know more liberal laws about divorce, about giving more, women more autonomy, all those kind of things that we would say right now is is a good idea, uh, and Lever just went on and he blew his top over this and he wrote all these letters denouncing George Darwin as immoral, as, as criminal in his beliefs. And as you might guess, the, the, this kind of annoyed Charles. And here's, here's a letter that uh, Charles wrote, which apparently did not actually get sent out, but it's in his, you know, Charles was a very cautious person. He would not have thrived in internet culture because his thing was, okay, he'd write this down and put it down and he'd think about it for a day before he'd send it off. And apparently this did not get sent off, but he wrote to me that your article in the QR, the quarterly review, I think that was, for July 1874 contains a wholly false and malicious accusation against, accusation against my son, Mr. G. Darwin, you had a fair opportunity in the following number of retracting your infamous and explicit accusation. That's the accusation of immorality. And you did not even make this small reparation. Your article also includes deliberate misrepresentations of what I have published. Therefore, I refuse to hold for the future any communication with you, sir. Yeah, so Charles Darwin blocked him, basically canceled them, said, no, you're done. Uh, I am the most famous scientist in the world. 
and we're not going to be communicating anymore. Yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, Nestle says, you know, or an abusive spouse. Well, maybe. I don't know. A lot of a lot of Victorian gentlemen might be willing to concede that yes, sometimes men are abusive, but couldn't imagine an uh, an abusive wife. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, so this is the basis of a huge amount of contention here. So he's he's a pariah in the scientific community. He also picked fights with Huxley and all these other people. Uh, and as it says up here, still, he, he tried to profess friendship for Darwin and to excuse his actions, but a number of Darwin supporters shunned him. And although critical of the theory of natural selection, especially as applied to humans, I should mention also Wallace didn't like, did not like to apply selection to humans. He thought the human intellect was a divine gift. And so that's something different. So he's, he's still critical of the theory of natural selection, uh, but he did support broadly evolutionary views. And this I thought was a little misleading in this article. Yes, he was excommunicated from the Catholic church shortly before his death. Um, it had nothing to do with his views on evolution. Not one thing. Uh, to the Catholic church then and now, the issue of evolution was not that big a deal. They were fairly tolerant of evolutionary ideas. Okay, so he's excommunicated from the church, though. So what was he excommunicated for? Because he picked a fight with the church as well. And, and this is this is kind of hilarious. Uh, he wrote an article. Yeah, uh, it's an article called Happiness in Hell. And I'll include a link down below because it's it's a blast to read that what this is, is Mivart is taking exception to the Catholic doctrine of hell. Yes, he didn't, he didn't think it was a place of eternal punishment. So as he says here, this is the last page of the article, he says, nothing in fact has been defined by the church on the subject of hell, which does not accord with right reason, the highest morality, and the greatest benevolence. So he's trying to flatter the Catholic Church a little bit here. Yeah, they're all for reason, morality, benevolence. That sounds, doesn't that sound exactly like the Catholic Church to you? Anyway, he goes on to argue on that basis that, that God was moral and benevolent and all this thing. Uh, so he says, according to it, no one in the next life suffers the deprivation of any happiness which he can imagine or desire, or which is congruous with his nature and faculties, save by his conscience, conscious and deliberate choice. According to it also, God has refused to no man who fully obeys the voice of conscience, heathen though he may be, the full beatitude of the light of glory and the beatif beatific vision. Yeah, so he's saying, well, you know, if, if you can have, if you can imagine happy pagans, people who don't, didn't believe in Christianity, but still couldn't be thrown into hell, there they are. So he says, hell in its widest sense, namely as including all those blameless souls who do not enjoy that vision, must be considered as for them an abode of happiness, trans... Yes, hell must be considered an abode of happiness, transcending all our most vivid anticipations so that man's natural capacity for happiness is there gratified to the very utmost. Nor is it even possible for the Catholic theologian of the most severe and rigid school to deny that thus considered there is and there will be for all eternity, there will for all eternity be a real and true happiness in, in hell. Uh, he kind of he kind of messed up there because he says, "Okay, it's not even possible for a Catholic theologian to imagine a punishing hell." Of course, they did, and and this is this is what got him. Um, this is what got him kicked out of the Catholic Church. He, he was a very devout Catholic. He just had his own weird interpretation of Catholicism. And if, when you, if you read this article, you might have a lot of, I mean, it's, it's a loony article. 
because he's making all these claims about the nature of a metaphysical place just on the basis of his reasonable conclusion about how a benign God would operate. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's actually kind of a sympathetic perspective he's got that, yeah, God wouldn't throw people into a hell of eternal torment. Um, he also argues that souls in hell could learn that they'd be given the opportunity to eventually come to Jesus from their experience in hell. So yeah, he's, it's, it's not a great, great idea as far as the Catholic church goes, but to us pagans, it's probably a little bit attractive. So yeah, he's arguing there is truly happiness in hell. So better believe it. Um, and of course the church then kicked him out. Okay. So that's enough about poor St. George Mivert that, you know, again, I, I kind of feel sorry for him. What, what a horrible fate. He's a devout, he's a devout Catholic. He really believes in the Catholic church. And then to be, you know, excommunicated shortly before his death is uh, kind of unfortunate. You know, even, even if he doesn't believe in natural selection, he's wrong there. But uh, that, again, you, you don't get punished by the Catholic Church so much for belief in scientific ideas as you do from going against the, the doctrines of the church. So anyway, uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's a tough one for a militant atheist like myself that I, I can't exactly blame the Catholic Church for halting progress. Uh, okay, yeah, there's the example of witches in the past. They, they did subscribe to a lot of superstitious beliefs, but then everybody did. Yeah, it was, you know, you go to, you go look at English history and it's, it's the Protestants who are running around doing horrible things. Uh, same with American history. Yeah, the, the Red Scare, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's superstitious behavior and it's, can't be ascribed to the Catholic Church. So quit making me defend them. All right.